Imagine a little boy with a long, funny sounding name, Greek actually, sitting on a crowded bench like those altar boys this morning with his fellows and forgotten except when it's his turn, when it comes around on the roll call and it doesn't very often. His name is Epiphany and he's no little boy. He's a giant in the calendar of the Catholic Church. Only Epiphany in the true Catholic Church is not usually celebrated on a Sunday except when the twelfth day of Christmas comes on the first day of the week. And Epiphany means from the Greek to reveal or to make known. Epiphany is the solemn visit of a god or of a king. It's older epiphany is than Christmas and it's kept with a full octave. No saints days are permitted. For eight days in a row the mass of epiphany is read devoutly. We call it, or they used to call it, little Christmas, but actually it is greater, as I say, than Christmas. The celebration, the knowledge of Epiphany has diminished over the years, but happily, in many countries and places, there still are the traditional Epiphany activities, the sacramentals. And that, I think, makes it to be, well, sort of a cozy, comfortable, just for the family kind of a feast. It still is a very great day in many lands. Down in Mexico, they have a fiesta today, and there's the little Nino Dios, and if you get that in the cake at the meal, then you have the privilege of hosting the next fiesta for our Lord, which will be La Candelaria, the Feast of Candlemas on February 2nd. The French have a different take on that. They have the Gâteau des Rois, and um, that's served at the Epiphany dinner, And if you get the little baby in your piece, why then you get to wear a crown for the rest of the meal in honor of Christ, our King. And in Italy, they used to have the custom that Bafania would come and she would give gifts to the children today in memory of the gifts of the wise men. For the English, this was Twelfth Night in Shakespeare, who was a Catholic after all refers to it in his plays. And we in this country we have a solemn mass, solemn as possible, and the home blessing. There are three miracles that we honor each year on the Feast of Epiphany, whereby our Lord manifests himself as God to the whole world. And the first of these is the star and the coming of the Magi from Iran, from Persia, from the East with their gifts. And the second we celebrate next Sunday, on a Sunday too this year, and that's the baptism of our Lord, his theophany, the Greeks call it, which means the the proper manifestation of a God. Next Sunday, watch for the manifestation of the three persons of the Blessed Trinity. And then the Sunday after that, the last of the miracles, which is that of Cana and Galilee, the first of our Lord's miracles in his public life. The first of these miracles, though, of Epiphany is that of a star. Some say perhaps it was a comet, and these astronomer priests, the magi, seekers of truth, obviously very earnest men, studied the stars, the sky, and they followed what was in effect a whispered command heard only in their own hearts. And they departed after the star. The Jesuit astronomer lived in the 17th century, Johannes Kepler. He said that Jupiter stood still along with Saturn over Bethlehem. And that was the sign. But in any case, they saw it and they followed at very great cost. 
But stop for a moment and reflect. The goodness of the good God. Doesn't he always suit the message to the man? For Peter, it was fish because he was a fisherman. And so the nets were filled to overflowing time and again. For the teachers in the temple when our Lord was 12, those gray and wrinkled old doctors of the law, it was pointed questions that the divine child posed them. And then his precocious answers, which left them flummoxed. Who is this one? And then he was just a smooth-faced boy. And he was just at the point, remember, just at the point where it would be either he is the Messiah and you must worship him or he is a phony and you must crucify him. And it was at that point that the mother of God intervened. It was not yet time. Mary would know when her son's time was. And then, going back to Christmas, it was those simple, devout shepherd priests. They say that those shepherds were of the priestly tribe, and they raised the sheep at Bethlehem. It's all Everything in the Old Testament is symbolic. And the more you study and find out, the more it all fits together, and you think to yourself, how could you ever be a Protestant or a Novus Ordo? It all fits together so beautifully. They were shepherd priests. They were raising lambs at Bethlehem. House of bread is the meaning of that Hebrew name. To be sacrificed daily, morning and night, in the temple. And for them, it was angels, God's messengers. But for the Magi, these watchers of the stars and the skies, it was the miraculous conjunction of the planets over Bethlehem. And doesn't he send, even to us, now and again, some sudden star flashing across the horizon of our otherwise dark minds? Some bright inspiration. Do this. You need to do this. Or leave off that ignoble association. Give that up. Shut up, turn away, cut it off, however you want to phrase it. Or even he might inspire you to slip into the confessional. That's the Christmas cave, where Christ is born in countless souls year around, to find peace and pardon, and it's only the lack of those two qualities that make us to be restless and sad. If you are, you need to step in there for a moment and see about it. He is a wise man who follows the star when our Lord sends the sign, but it could be a very subtle, almost a silent one. Now, the depiction of the trip of the wise men, their long journey, is charming. It's like a colorful Christmas card almost. I was worried about our wise men getting here today, but I see they made it on time. And there they are in the stable. And it looks also so beautiful and peaceful. But as T.S. Eliot says in his famous poem, and a hard time of it we had to get there. It must have been wearying. It must have been rough. They weren't boarding tourist buses, that's for sure. It was no vacation. Well, sometimes this journey is a struggle for us, is it not? Drag yourself out of bed in the morning. And then what if the camel doesn't start? And then some little kings and queens at home might make a fuss. They're not in the mood for church. but all And then all of a sudden, the devil always works this way. Our imagination, like a magnifying glass, begins to extend the difference in time, smiles, and exaggerate the difficulties. Till 
the project of getting myself and my family to St. Hugh for Sunday Mass seems semi-heroic. And if I make it, surely I'd qualify for the red vestments of a martyr. But at those times, it's good to have a comparison chart to consider, how long did it take the Magi? They say, some say several years, others four months, others four weeks. But in any case, it was not easy to find him who was born king of the Jews. For us, generally speaking, I think with our chapels and masses, I think the average time is about 40 minutes. For some, it's considerably less. And for others, it's much, much longer. And usually, there's a a disproportionate ratio between how far you have to come to Mass and how much you complain about it. But in any case, it's not the trip of the wise men. True, no incredible star is waiting to lead us, but there is that twitching red lamp when you come into this church to greet you, and the same Christ in the white swaddling clothes, which symbolize obedience because he was all bound up, of the sacred host. And isn't he worth the ride? If only to remind us that we're not just going to church, not here, we're going to God in this house of bread. He demands his tribute from you, it is true, but isn't the good Lord worth the three spoonfuls of incense the priest puts over the coals and the thurible for the mass and sensations, benediction. But remember, the altar boy doesn't light the charcoal. It's not going to do any good. There won't be any smoke or fragrance. If your hearts are not aflame with the love of God, it's not going to do any good. There won't be any flame of faith or fragrance of of piety. So the kings arrived, and our picture our Blessed Mother, the Virgin Mary, looking up, and she sees these tall, exotic figures, because she's on her knees, adoring her God, who is her son, and they're, they're standing over the mother and the child, towering so tall. Do you think Our Lady smiled for a moment? and thought how in all of their glittering trappings before they knelt down themselves and adored, how maybe they foreshadowed the soaring towers of our cathedrals and the beautiful churches we used to have, and that they would one day rise up in his honor, these external manifestations of God's worship. Or even... When she saw their rich garments, she would think of a cozy little chapel on 12th and Hayes where God would still be worshipped and his faith held most precious. And did God give her to see all of this as a joy? You know, the Franciscans in their rosary have the seven joys of Mary and they have a whole decade just for the epiphany. There was so much joy. And she needed the joy, and the joy never left her heart, but when Simeon spoke, that would be another story. It would indicate the dull heart throb of pain. And Our Lady would see, already in prophecy, that sardonic signboard, they would hang above her son, hailing him, too, as a king, but as a king whose throne was the cross and whose crown glowed with the dull rubies of clotted blood on piercing thorn. The Beretta, the priest, the mitre of a bishop, that represents not only a crown, but the crown of thorns. But all of this at Epiphany 
would be written on a late, later page. So having adored, they drew near and they offered their princely gifts, prized products of particular realms. The prodding thought maybe as we meditate on epiphany would insert itself. What kind of gift would I, should I bring? Well, the sad truth is that like the kings, we not only live far from our Lord, but the only particular product that we have ever produced in our lives is sin. But the good news is the baby's interested in it. There are some wonderful paintings, you know, of the, of the nativity, especially by the Italian Renaissance painter Andrea Lotto. And you see the baby when the gifts come, either it's the lamb at Christmas time, it's in our holy card, or you see it with the wise men, the baby is reaching out and grabbing the present just as a little baby boy would do. What does the holy child reach out and grab from you if not your sins? Remember the story of St. Jerome, how that he lived the last years of his life in the grotto cave next to that of, of Bethlehem. And one day he prayed, meditating before Christmas, that he had nothing worthy at all to give our Lord, even though he had done so much for him. And our Lord appeared to him and said to him very simply, he said, Jerome, give me your sins. That's what our Lord wants. And tell him as you give them, you don't want them anymore. You're through with them forever. And do you remember the story of that French priest, the Père Barbara, who was a great traditionalist leader in the 60s and 70s, how when he was sick, a priest friend of mine would go to see him. One time he was sitting with Father and another priest arrived and this priest was greeted by Father Barbara with the words, Ah, Louis, il est mon pauvre. He, he's my garbage can. And the other priest thought, Garbage can? What do you mean, Father? And he explained, He hears my confessions. I deposit the garbage of my sins in him. And that priest had a difficult, but a very beautiful and a holy death because he knew how to use the trash can. A pretty sorry gift of gold, you'll say? Maybe, but by the heavenly alchemy, the base metal, even of a bad life, can be sprinkled with tears of love, of, of regret, and bathed in the blood of Christ and becomes something precious, fit for a king. If he's our savior, he's got to save us from something, and that is ourselves and our sins. Finally, to the trio of the three kings from the east and the king of heaven, there comes into the epiphany picture, and he's always there, a fifth king, the sly and the sinister Herod. There's always a Herod in the story with his crafty eyes and his political and plotting tongue. He unctuously besought the wise men. You know, political leaders have that quality of being able to lie without batting an eyelash. And so did Herod that when they had found the king whose cradle was overshadowed by a star, that they should send word back to Jerusalem, so that I coming might adore him. What he really wanted, the screams of the slaughtered innocents made brutally clear. The wise men were warned to go back by a different way, home. And at Epiphany each year we make that resolution for our new year. After this Christmas, after my Christmas confession and communion, I'll go back home a different way. So I make it home to heaven. Shouldn't we do the same? If an honest inventory 
makes me realize I have little to give up the Lord except for my sins, shouldn't I return back to my regular life now by a different road? What are the use of sentimental feelings which you have for a holiday and then you pack them away with the kings and the artificial wreaths till next year? When the memories of this Christmas fade, your resolutions will fade as well. And you'll shrug your shoulders and just go back to those same old slippery paths and you'll be ambushed again by the devil. Same place and the same way. He doesn't have to get too original. Not with us. Thank God it's Christmas a bit longer and you can linger here in loving meditation. But when the time comes to go back, my friend, go back a different way. Shine on, Christmas star, light of the world, throughout this whole year of 2019, lead us into a, to a cleaner and a kinder and a nobler and a holier kind of a life This new year deserves a new road, and wise men will take it. God bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.